Happy Halloween, if you're watching this the day it goes up. Today we'll be going over how I made that creepy scene using Blender for the tracking, cloth simulation, and After Effects for the compositing. For some parts, I'll give an overview of what I did so you can understand the process, and for other parts, I'll dive into more detail. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment and I'll try my best to give you an answer, unless someone else helps you out first. Now let's get started and talk a bit about tracking our footage. I've actually made a whole video already about how motion tracking in Blender works that you can watch, but this scene did present a unique challenge and that was tracking dark, lower quality footage. I didn't bring my camera with me when I moved to the UK, so all I could use to make this was my iPhone, and the only lighting I had was its flash, so it pretty much meant I was guaranteed some noisy footage. For those of you who don't know a lot about motion tracking, it's a process used to basically track the motion of points in your footage. Then when you have a bunch of points tracked accurately, you can use that data to create a virtual camera that moves exactly like your camera moved when you shot the footage. With that, you can just drop 3D objects in the scene, and they should move properly as if they were actually there when you recorded. So the very first problem I ran into came up before I even filmed anything, and that was how can I get any sort of usable tracking data using dark and noisy footage taken on my phone? After thinking on it for a bit, I had one idea. What if I taped a reflective construction vest to the wall, and that way the lighting from my flash would bounce off the tape and show up as a bright spot that I could track and then later remove in After Effects? Or I could, I could just use reflective tape. I used the reflective tape. When it arrived, I shot a little test by cutting out a small square of it and putting it on the wall, and then with all the lights out except for my phone's flash, I took a video and would you look at that? A perfect tracking point in the dark. Then all I had to do was arrange reflective tape around the room. To get a usable track, you need to have markers at different distances from the camera, so I placed a bunch on the back wall, some on the desk closest to the camera, and then as some sort of middle ground, I stuck four on the back of one of my monitors. It's worth mentioning that reflective tape works best when lit and viewed from straight on. I did try to place tape on one of the desks as well as the floor, but because of the angle not being right, they were actually really tough to track, and a lot of it had to be annoyingly tracked manually in Blender. After filming, I threw it all into After Effects and rendered it back out as an image sequence so that I could import it into Blender without any issues. And like I said earlier, I've got a whole tutorial on tracking in Blender that you can check out, so I'll just give you an overview here. I opened Blender and chose the VFX preset to bring up the motion tracking panels quickly, imported my image sequence and then set up my markers to track position only. Then holding control, I clicked on my markers to create tracking points and tracked forwards. When I finished, I just went through and adjusted any of the points that got lost along the way and then tracked them forwards again. And like I said earlier, some of the points on the floor had to be manually tracked because of the angle of the tape. After getting enough tracking points to give me a solid camera solve, I clicked setup scene and hid the default cube and plane so that I could see the grid and the axes more clearly. I selected my origin point to be on the table, even though typically you'd want that to be the floor, because it was easier to align the camera here since the table has a clear example of X, Y, and Z axis that I could use to orient the scene. I then chose one point next to the origin to set as the X axis, and then from there I moved the camera up so that the world origin would be on the corner of the desk. Then I just needed to rotate the camera so that the X, Y, and Z axis matched up with the desk, and I'm good. Now that we've got it tracked, it's helpful to give ourselves a rough block out of the scene so we can better visualize the space we have to work with. So using the tracking points and the camera view as reference, I just set the viewport to wireframe and started placing cubes and planes to stand in for the desks and walls. Once everything's blocked out, we can actually start working towards creating our ghosts. To make them, I pretty much just applied a cloth simulation to a plane and then dropped it onto a mannequin. So to get yourself a mannequin, there are a few options. You can go to Mixamo and download one. There's a program called Make Human you could use to create people, or you can just make something really rough yourself. After I've imported my mannequin from Mixamo, placed it in the scene, and created a plane just above it, we're ready to create our cloth simulation. Now simulations of any kind are extremely finicky and usually involve a lot of trial and error to get it right, so I'll save you the trouble and just explain what I found I had to do to make it work and why. First things first, we need to scale the plane up a little bit so that when it drapes over the mannequin, it'll actually reach the floor. Next, we need to subdivide the plane a bunch, because as it stands, there's nothing the simulation has to work with here. It's just a plane with four vertices. So hitting tab to enter edit mode, I right clicked and subdivided the plane, and in its options, I increased it to the max, which is 10. Now 10 still isn't enough to give us some detailed cloth, so I subdivided it six more times. If we simulate the cloth now, it's just gonna fall straight down, because we need to actually set the mannequin up as a collider first. That way the simulation knows to react to the mannequin and fall onto it. Now that we have a collider set up, we can bake the simulation as a test to show you what we've got so far. Nice. There are some immediate problems that we can fix by adjusting some cloth simulation settings. First of all, I'll increase the simulation quality to 10, increase the bending values to 2, which basically tell the simulation to resist folding in on itself a little bit. You can think of it as being just a slightly thicker cloth now, where 0 would be like silk and 150 would be like leather. Then we'll increase the collision quality to 15 and enable self-collision so that the cloth doesn't clip through itself. Since we're subdividing the cloth quite a bit to give it more detail, we need to decrease the values for both collision distances. If we don't, the cloth will think it's inside of itself and start flipping out. For the regular collision distance, I'll set it to 0.005, and for self-collisions, we'll set it to 
All the settings we've changed are gonna dramatically increase the time the simulation will take to bake, and we still need to subdivide it even more so that it falls more naturally around the mannequin's body. So all that to say, our computer is in for a bad time. But something we can do to help a little bit when it comes to subdividing further is to selectively subdivide where we need it most. If I just head into the top view for a sec and enable X-Ray, I'll enter edit mode on our plane and hit B to bring up the box selection tool. From here, I'll drag a big old box around the mannequin, right click, and then subdivide that once. After that, I'll select a point in the center, hit B again, and this time draw a box that just fits over its body and subdivide it one more time. This way, we're making it so the cloth around the mannequin's head and body have a greater level of detail without wasting subdivisions on the edges of the cloth that are just gonna be draping downwards anyways. Running the simulation now, you can see that we've solved a lot of the weird head collision issues and the cloth is folding a lot more naturally around the body. And since we didn't just blanket subdivide the whole thing, we're saving time on the simulation bake as well. But if we let the simulation play out, we've got a problem. The cloth eventually slides right off. This was actually a pretty simple fix. I selected the mannequin, went into edit mode, and box selected its head. Then I just right clicked and separated it into its own mesh. Then I went into the new separated heads collider settings and increased the friction up to 5, so now it grips the cloth better and won't slide off. Now all that's left to do is right click the cloth and set it to shade smooth, and I'll also apply a subdivision surface modifier to it to smooth out any harsh edges. And after baking again, we've got this. Now that we've got the simulation pretty much down, I selected the cloth and hit M to move it into its own collection, and then disabled it so that I could work on the animation. Since mannequins from Mixamo come with rigs, it's just as simple as entering pose mode and playing with the keyframes. For the ghost standing by the stove, I just made its head slowly turn all the way around, and for my second ghost closer to the doorway, I made it very stiffly snap its neck to look at the camera because I thought that would be pretty creepy. Once I felt I got the animation dialed in, it was time to unhide the cloth simulation, duplicate it, and then place them over top of each mannequin. Since it takes some time for the cloth to actually drop onto them, what I did was make sure both of their simulations started to bake at frame negative 100. That way they have 100 frames to land and settle down before we even hit frame zero. Also, it's important to cache your bakes to the disk so that your simulation is saved even after you close and reopen Blender. Now with everything set up and finally looking good, I started the long bake. Two hours later. Sweet, so now that we have the simulation baked how we want it, we need to light the scene to match the footage as close as possible. Since the only light was coming from my phone's flash, I just had to make a spotlight, position it right beside the camera where the flash would be on my phone, and then parented the spotlight to the camera so that they moved together. To get the spotlight to always face the same direction as the camera, I just applied a copy rotation constraint to it and told it to watch the camera. And now the light and camera move together. Before I tried to tweak the spotlight settings, I needed to make some shadow catchers, which are just geometry that don't show up in the render, but still let shadows interact with them. I made a plane for the back wall, the floor, and some for the stove, and then in their visibility settings chose Shadow Catcher. Now if we jump into render view, you can see that the shadows interact with them, but we don't see the planes themselves. Now that we've got those made, I just had to tweak the spotlight settings to try my best to match the sharpness of the shadows in the footage, as well as tweaking the cone size and intensity. After that, I UV unwrapped the cloth and added a fabric material to it just to give it some texture, and then I was good to go for rendering. I didn't get too fancy with it, I just rendered two passes, one for just the ghosts and another for just the shadows. To create the shadow only pass, I just hid the ghosts by selecting them and in their visibility settings, I disabled view from camera. That way their shadows were still cast on the shadow catchers, but they wouldn't show up themselves. So after rendering those two passes out, we can finally get to compositing them in After Effects. I went ahead and imported their image sequences into the project and fixed their frame rate by right clicking them and selecting interpret footage since image sequences always import at 30 FPS. After bringing the renders into the comp, the first thing I wanted to do was create a mat for the doorway so that we didn't see them through the wall. So I created a new solid, set its opacity to zero so that I could see the footage, and created a simple mask. Then just went about aligning the mask with the door frame, moving forward 10 frames and then tweaking the mask all the way until the end. After that, I locked the mask layer and exactly the same way, I went through and created another mask for the fridge as well. When I finished making the mat, I just added the set mat effect to the ghost render and targeted our mat layer, set it to effects and masks, and then inverted the mat. And now we don't see the ghost through the wall. From here, we can just select the masks and feather them slightly to make the lines less clinically crisp, and we can also just copy the set mat effect onto the ghost shadow layer as well, giving us this. Next, I applied a Gaussian blur to the ghosts and set the strength really low, like 1.5, to match their sharpness to the footage using the door frame as reference. We also have to remember to raise the blur above the set matte effect, because the order of our effects stack matters. If I turn the blur away up and place it below the set matte effect, you can see why. We don't want to be cutting the door frame away and then blurring the layer, we want to be blurring the layer and then cutting the door frame away. Next, we'll want to add grain to our render to match it to the footage's grain. If only there was an effect for that. I applied the match grain effect, set the viewing mode to final output, and set the noise source layer to the footage. Now there's a chance it'll look alright for you and the grain will be matched, but in most cases it's gonna need help. So changing the viewing mode to noise samples, we can see boxes where it's sampling noise from our footage. Now if we open up the sampling dropdown, we can switch the sampling selection over to manual, open the noise sampling points dropdown, and then manually choose better sample points for the noise. 
The best points to pick are against a flat color, so anywhere against the back wall would be great, but not on the edge of the desk for example. After selecting our points, just switch the viewing mode back to final output and the grain will look a lot better. We aren't quite done with it yet though. Zooming in, I think it looks a little big, so in the tweaking settings, I'll lower the size to 0.8. It's also a tad too saturated, so we can lower that to 0.5 in the color settings as well. Finally, under application, I'm going to lower the highlights to 0.5 because grain is usually strongest in the dark areas and weakest in the bright ones, and then we should be all good. I made sure to render these ghosts without any motion blur so that while compositing I could add some in and match it to the motion blur of the footage. So moving to a point in the shot where I've got noticeable blur, I added the pixel motion blur effect to the ghost render. This effect is great, but it likes to be applied before most other effects, so after dragging it to the top everything should look normal again, but with some motion blur. This effect just basically looks at your layer and tries to apply motion blur based on how it thinks things are moving, and usually it does a pretty good job. The main thing we have to dial in here is the shutter angle. As we increase it, the blur gets longer, and as we decrease it, the blur gets shorter. It already looks pretty good at 180, but increasing it to 250 I think looks a bit better. Next, we've got to tackle removing the tracking points from the footage. For that, I used After Effects' built-in content-aware fill. To use it, we need to create holes in the footage and then run content-aware fill to fill in those holes. The usual workflow for this would be to create masks set to subtract around each point and then keyframe them to stay on target throughout. But there are two other options I can think of. We could just create a mask around a point, right click the mask and choose motion track and track the mask forward, but this will take a while if we're doing every single point, so instead I'll be using the fact that these points are so bright to create a luma mat to remove them. First I soloed the footage and duplicated it. On the top copy I added the levels effect and brought everything in to single out the bright tracking points. Next I'll just create and animate a really loose mask to get rid of the walls and then set the track mat of the footage layer below it to luma inverted. And now we can see the tracking points are holes in the footage. If we look at the content aware fill panel now, you should see that the areas that we've cut out are filled in with white. Looking at our footage, the holes aren't quite big enough to cover the entire tracking point, so we can just increase the alpha expansion to solve that. Then I'll switch the fill method to surface, set the lighting correction to strong, and finally hit generate fill layer. And it's looking pretty good. Now that we've got the ghosts composited and the tracking points removed, we can finally add some final effects to make it look a little bit better. First I created a new adjustment layer and added the levels effect to it, then I raised the input black and lowered the output white to add a little bit more contrast and darken the shot a bit. Next I wanted to give it a sort of paranormal activity-esque night vision look to it, so I added the tint effect and remapped the white to a very pale green. Then I followed the age old rule of visual effects which is to dial it into what you think looks right, then decrease it by 50%. Lastly, to help the render and footage mesh together a little bit more, I added another grain over top of the whole thing. I set the intensity and size both to 0.5, and just like the match grain from earlier, I went into the application dropdown and lowered the grain in the highlights to 0.1. I also changed the blending mode to screen. So with this adjustment layer, we've darkened our shot a little bit, stylized it to feel more like night vision, and then added a tiny bit of grain on top to help incorporate the render and the footage just a bit more. And that's about it. That's the overview of how I created and composited this creepy ghost scene. If you're still in the mood for creepy Halloween stuff, I suggest checking out my previous video which is a video essay tailored for editors and filmmakers called How Horror Films Create Suspense. It took ages to make and YouTube didn't push that video out to all of you, so I'd love it if you gave it a watch and also left a comment or like if you enjoyed it to teach the algorithm who's boss. I've also taken the liberty of editing out any jump scares in the video so you don't have to worry about that while watching. But before you go ahead and watch that, let me take this opportunity to thank this video sponsor, Skillshare. If you didn't know, Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes for creators. They've got a ton of topics you can explore, but the ones that I was personally drawn to were film and video, obviously, productivity, and creative writing. A class that I watched recently that I think you might enjoy is Marquez's course called YouTube Success, Script, Shoot, and Edit with MKBHD. He goes over planning videos, how they shoot their iconic footage, the editing workflow, and more, so definitely give it a watch if you decide to give Skillshare a go. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, so you don't have to worry about ads, and they're constantly launching new premium classes for members so you can stay focused and follow where your creativity takes you. If you're interested in joining, the first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Thanks Skillshare!